This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. The North Clan of Hyena has a brand new den. There are lots of cubs here and we can't wait to introduce them all to you. This is Safari Live. This is so exciting. We've managed to find the sausage tree prime. Look at this last dash. This is amazing. Look at that incredible strength. 20 seconds. Here come the cheetah. Unbelievable stuff. I'm just keeping my head on a swivel. You never know what's going to happen next in these situations. Standing by. Can you believe this? Good evening and welcome to the penultimate episode of season two's Safari Live. My name is James Hendry and it is an enormous privilege to be talking to you from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. We are of course live from Kenya here and in South Africa, there in the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. Please do talk to us during the course of the show. You can send us any questions you might have. You can tweet us using the hashtag Safari Live. You can send us any jokes you might want to give us as well. We're hopefully going to introduce you to all these little cubs. I don't know who they are, so we're going to learn about them all together over the course of the next hour. If you did miss last week, again, shame upon you, but we had a wonderful time here in the Mara again for the first time in a while and down at Juma. Hi. Last week on Safari Live, Lauren welcomed the Styx Pride back to Juma after a long absence. Tristan waited patiently, hoping to introduce you to the new Nkuhuma cubs. Equally patient was Hosanna, staking out a warthog burrow with Jamie. We were awed, appalled, and amazed by a wild dog hunt and their spirited expulsion of would-be thieves. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the Mara, I watched the Olololo pride in the Kitchell males polishing off a buffalo. And we had a taste of the terror that it is to cross the Mara River. This is Safari Live. So that's what happened last week. Now, if you're wondering why we are in black and white, we are in fact in infrared, so we're not actually in black and white. The infrared cameras allow us to look at these animals without sort of blinding them with cricket-style spotlights, and that's always a good idea because it just helps us to observe their behavior without affecting it. Now, we have the North Clan here, and we introduced them to you last season, and possibly even at the beginning of this season, I think we may have visited them once or twice, but they've since moved dens. And those two big animals that you can see there, the biggest ones, I believe to be the little cubs of Waffles, the ex-matriarch. So Waffles was the matriarch for a long time, very famous hyena. She had two little cubs on the 28th of July last year, and I think that's them now. It's very difficult to tell, of course, because we haven't been with them continuously, but I think that's who we're looking at. And if you did miss the introduction to the North Clan, it's a giant clan of hyenas, about 70 strong, and it's led or sort of dominated by a hyena called Soup, who is the granddaughter of Waffles. She took the matriarchy from her grandmother a little bit, ooh, probably about three months ago or so, and Waffles now ranks beneath her and her two youngsters, Lobster and Chow. It's all quite confusing, all very difficult to identify these animals, but we'll get into it a little bit later. Right now, we're going to send you back in time, back into daylight, back to the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park with a highly irascible Brent Leo Smith for spending time with a wonderful pack of wild dogs. We've had lots of luck. It's my puppies. I love puppies. Now, they definitely got chased by the lion, so they're probably about seven, eight hundred meters from where they, we left them this morning. Um, but they are lovely and flat. Now, as with most creatures out here, patience 
is important, but less so with the dogs. Um, I say it's probably going to be 20 minutes to half an hour uh, before they get moving. 14 of them, they're definitely going to have to hunt again this evening. We are getting to the right time of the day when they could, they're going to get moving. As I said, they don't stay flat for too long in comparison to the other predators. Now, most of the adults have moved off behind us. Uh, now the puppies are starting to wake up. So we hopefully should be seeing that incredible greeting ceremony shortly. All that tittering and, and high-pitched squeaks and whines. Now, there's one of the most beautiful wild dogs in terms of coats I've seen in quite a long time and uh, she's just having a scratch at the back but they look at that coat pattern as so distinct and so stunning now wait when she walks she's just got the loveliest coat isn't that absolutely gorgeous Good afternoon, South Africa. I hope you are all having a lekker one. And we are joined here by the Avoca male lion who is limping quite heavily at the moment. My name is Patrick, all the way from Australia. Joining me on camera is Seb, all the way from France. And remember, remember this is completely live and completely interactive. So if you have any questions or comments, please send them in using the hashtag Safari Live. Now, this lion was down on a kill and just almost right on cue for TV has gotten up and we can see just how heavily this lion is actually limping. Interested in this stick here, apparently. Now, I did say that this was an evoker male, which is the evokers are a coalition of three male lions, this being one of them. The other two are on a different property right now, away from where we are. They are actually with a pride that they control called the Inkahuma pride. But this one, because of its injury, I believe, has lagged behind and has been solitary for the last few days, all on his own. And he hasn't really been moving much, but surprisingly today, he has been moving a lot, a real lot, actually, considering how badly he is injured. He's moved all the way from the northwestern side of the property of where we are in Juma in South Africa, all the way down to the southeastern side. So he's diagonally gone across and then he has found a carcass, picked it up and dragged it about 300 metres to where we are right now. And, well, we're hoping that he decides to go and eat, but what he is doing right now, I don't know. Now, I'm not the only one here in Juma. We also have Miss Jamie Patterson driving around. Let's go across to her. As it happens, I'm not too far away from where Pat is now, and I'm thrilled that that particular male lion has managed to get himself some food, even if it isn't particularly appetizing. A very good evening to you all. My name is Jamie, and behind the camera is Craig, and it is my most desperate desire to give Craig something to film on this lovely evening. I spent the entire day track tracking that male lion and I have to tell you that although he has a rather painful looking limp, it didn't stop him from going all the way through Juma, which is where we are at the moment, and then all the way back out again exactly the same way that he came. So he obviously knew that there was food down there towards Chitwa Chitwa. Where I am at the moment is the eastern boundary of Juma, and I've heard a report that there are lions not far away from where we are now. A pride called the Inkuhumas. If you've been watching over the past few weeks, you will know that they are one of our regular characters. And, of course, for those of us that have been watching them for many, many years, a very firm favorite. We, I know them very well. I'm not sure if we've mentioned it, but one of the lionesses actually has two tiny cubs as well. We probably won't be seeing the cubs tonight. It's not particularly ethical to follow a lioness with tiny cubs around. But we could see the rest of the pride and hopefully see the rest of the pride reunited once again. They've been separated for an extended period of time now. Oh, as we scan along with our spotlight and wait for the lions to pop out, hopefully to go down to the waterhole to drink, don't go anywhere. We're going to be taking a short break, but any moment now, the lions could come strolling out of the bushes and our evening could change completely. We'll see you soon.
Hello everybody, look at what's going on here. I'm not sure there's been a huge amount of activity suddenly at the North Clan Den. Let's just go to the adult to the left if we can. A little bird flying in there. It's really quite difficult to tell what on earth is going on here. But there's some nice sounds. Well, there's a fight now. I can't drive there because I'm afraid I will drive over the den. And I don't want to do that. Let's just wait and see what's happening. We might have to have a little bit of a move. It's not going chasing off into that stuff. Hello. Welcome back to your live safari from the Masai Mara here in beautiful Kenya. We're looking at some very young ones there. We'll go back to them now. It's just a great privilege to be sitting in amongst these hyenas here at the North Clan. And in fact, there's one just over here, which is too close to the car to even show, which is a very nice seg into Ndebele's question. Ndebele wants to know, are they dangerous to human beings? Look. In Debele, in this particular context, no, they're not. They're under the car, not posing any danger whatsoever. They're just curious. They can be dangerous to human beings in camping situations and where fatalities have been recorded. Normally, people have slept with tents open and hyenas are not intimidated by people at night nearly as much as they are during the day. And if you're lying down, they come into tents and they'll drag you out. So those are the fatalities that have been recorded on foot in the day, normally on foot at night, you wouldn't be afraid of a hyena. So no, not essentially dangerous to human beings unless you happen to be very silly and uh, lying out in the open during the night. Look at these little things. They are just fantastic. Now here comes a smaller one. Now that little thing, I think his name or her name is Gefelte Fish. Now, that's a very strange name. I have no idea where the name comes from, but that looks about the right age, and that's one of the youngest, probably the third youngest cub here at the North Clan Den. Now, the North Clan spends a lot of time during the migration season just to the north and west of where we are, some of the main crossings of the Mara River, and Taylor spent a lot of time down there this time last year. This is so exciting, it's what we've been waiting for. A herd of wildebeest and zebra all gathered at the same crossing. It looks like they're edging closer now. They're almost there, hoping to make the plunge into the murderous Mara River. Every year, the red oat grass plains of the Masai Mara sway with anticipation. About two million grazers are about to arrive to feast on nature's bounty. They come in search of food and water, all the way from the southern plains of the Serengeti in Tanzania. Hundreds of thousands of wildebeest, zebra and gazelle follow the cracking African thunderstorms, the greening pastures and the rolling rivers.
zebras are the vanguard, eating the longer grass and exposing the shorter shoots for the wildebeest behind. But all must face the ultimate migration gauntlet, the Mara River. Beneath the murky surface lurks nature's favorite villain. With reptilian patience, they've waited nine months for the migration feast. The herd sense the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. But not all will make it. For those that do, Hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. Survivors will enjoy feeding on tall grass before crossing the river again and again as they follow the storms for nourishment. So that sort of chaos is what these hyenas are looking forward to. They can't wait for the chaos to ensue. Hopefully in the next few weeks or so, maybe if we're very lucky during next week's final episode. Now, a very good question from Lee as to where the herds are. They are just south of the border between Tanzania and Kenya. So actually as the crow flies, probably between 40 and 50 kilometers from where we are now. They can easily cover that distance in a couple of days. So they may come up here. I suspect they're going to be around there for the next week, few weeks and before they start filtering slowly up into the Maasai Mara. That's what we think is going to happen. But Lee, a very nice question there. And I must just tell you that I've received information that gefilte fish apparently is a Jewish meal made of boiled fish balls. Uh, that sounds like an interesting thing to be eating. Let's go back to South Africa now, where Patrick is, is looking for his line. I'm not sure if he's still got him, and you can say g'day to him. Well, we are still here with this avoca male who has just moved down into this dry riverbed where it's a bit cooler for him so he can metabolise with that full belly. Now, I did mention that he has a carcass here. It's just hidden away in this bush at the moment. But the thing is with carcasses, especially at night time, is that they can attract other attention. Now, even on the way here, I did see a couple of hyenas and they didn't seem too interested. But as the night progresses, if they are hungry enough, they will come down and we will see a bit of conflict between the lions and the hyenas so we will stake it out here and see if that does happen so we might be able to see the carcass just in the bushes here we are in infrared at the moment so we don't have a whole heap of range but we can just see right in the middle of screen right now so that is the carcass there it is a dead kudu and as I mentioned earlier, this thing was dragged about 300 metres, maybe even a little bit further from its original location. So it could be stowed away under this tree. Now, we did see this exact same male lion probably about three or four days ago. And he had the, did the exact same thing with the zebra, kept it under bushes. Now, lions do look quite relaxed when they are like this, but they can also be very ferocious. So viewer discretion is advised for this next clip. If you are sensitive, please look away now. He's still with the dogs. Um, and they have started slowly getting moving. You can see they do love water. And uh, in certain parts where they've got to cross rivers and stuff, they always seem to choose pans. They are nervous of deep water where there could be a crocodile. So there we go. Oh, looks like they're... Oh, lion! No! 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 Oh, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That came out of nowhere. Oh no, she's after another dog. Oh no. Oh no. 
She's going back to kill this dog here. Have you got that, Jandre? Let me just go around. Oh no. Oh man, this was, this is, this. Guys, just be warned, this is really, really difficult to look at. This is nature and this is really hard for me. This is my favorite animal. It's one of the, the youngsters. And we were just talking about how high their mortality rates are. And the biggest threat to them is lions. Oh no, I'm shaking. The rest of the pack are still watching. Oh, this is so sad, guys. It's one of the Styx lionesses. So that's a fairly horrific thing to have seen, and especially when it was live. And I guess there must be many people asking why didn't we interfere, should we have interfered, and that's a wonderful discussion to have. And the answer really is no, we try not to interfere as much as possible, and we just let those things play out, dreadful and horrible and sad as they are. Now we're sitting here at the hyena den, and it looks to you like there is only one hyena left. In actual fact, there are about ten, and they are all under the car which is making life slightly difficult for me. Excuse me, could you come out? The answer is no, they cannot. They are probably tearing the brake line off of this vehicle and we will probably actually have to spend the next week sitting here, unable to get away from here. Right, well, you're going to go for a little break. We're going to try and extricate the hyenas out from underneath the car, and with any luck, when you come back, we'll have another pile of them where you can see them. don't have one hyena. We don't have one hyena now, everyone. They are all under the car. I'm actually going to start the car just to make them go away. <laughs> there we go. We have some more hyenas. Okay, let's go back across to Pat and he'll take us into TV with his lion. Welcome internet viewers, so we are still here with this sleepy, sleepy cat. Welcome back live to South Africa here in the Juma Game Reserve on the western fringes of the Kruger National Park. So we are still here with this lion and there hasn't been much movement at the moment. As I did mention, we are hoping that there will be some scavenging happening tonight or something coming to take interest because then there will be a little bit of conflict. And well, this lion though is not looking like he is in fight mode at all at the moment. He has put this kill very securely in a very actually nice spot where we are right now. We're in a dry riverbed, so there's not really much access completely from one side. And then the other side is also quite thick and tedious to get through. So he's done a very good job in hiding this thing. Now he did follow his drag marks here and he dragged it a very long way. Storm SA wants to know why is this lion limping? It's very beautiful, but why is it limping? Well, it is, I'm not actually sure why it is limping. I didn't see the injury myself or know why it happened, but it could either be that it was in a conflict with another lion, perhaps it was going for a hunt, maybe something like a buffalo or a kudu and got a bad knock. I really don't know for sure, but it definitely would have been in some sort of heated conflict, I think, whether it be hunting or a fight. But he has been limping around for quite some time now. It doesn't seem to be healing up too much at the moment, and it may be something that he is constantly kind of battling through. 
And we do know out here in the wild that even a small injury, even if it's just a slight bit debilitating, can ultimately lead to death. But the plight of a male lion is that of toughness and tenaciousness. And this male lion is showing just that. I've seen him on two carcasses over the last five days. Both kills, I'm sure he didn't make himself, but he still managed to come in and take it for his own, which is something that male lions do a lot. Okay, so Jamie Patterson is still out on the hunt, just not too far from where I am right now. Let's see how she's going. I am indeed out hunt and I have to tell you that it hasn't been very successful uh, not only has it not been successful but right now my left foot is currently hooked on something underneath my seat meaning that I cannot in any way reach the clutch so my left leg is stuck and I can't touch the clutch which means if I want to stop the car if I do see something now I'm gonna have to stall the car <laughs> to, to stop it I can't unhook it I don't quite know what to do. So in that case, given that we can only drive forward in second gear, we shall proceed forward with alacrity. <laughs> now, of course, we do have these, these slightly funny, very unexpected moments in the bush. We also have some very sad moments. As you know, this is something that Brent had to watch unfold between the sticks and the wild dog pack. And just to warn you once again, this is not for sensitive viewers. Oh my goodness. Oh. oh no, guys. There's that. Oh, guys, this is so... I'm sorry, I'm... I, I do warn you, this is, you got to be very careful. This is really, really, really difficult. Oh, she's going after the dogs again. No, go dogs, move it. Move. Okay. Oh. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say, guys. I know this is so difficult. What I think happened is the hooded vultures um, spotted. Uh, the lion spotted the, the, the hooded vultures coming down, and that's what attracted it here. Apparently, there's a Birmingham boy on his way here as well. Um, uh, this is such a thing. That, that, that thing is that the wild dog is dead. Um, there's not much we can do. We're going to try to see what's happening with the rest of the pack. Um, let me just... Okay, so they went off there. Now, there's no real roads in this area. Um, now, th this... Okay, let's just... What's happened now is the pack will have bombshelled. It might even take them 45 minutes to half an hour uh, to get back together. <sighs> and you know what? It, it, this is... I... Okay, let's take a breath. Here comes the lioness. She's coming back. Thankfully, the rest of the dogs got away, but it does show you the speed of all those animals, and a lion is incredibly fast. Now, I have been stalked, as you can see, by a spider. I am not moving. This is why I'm not turning to face you, because there is a spider hunting on my collar. It is not, in fact, hunting me. It is hunting the flies that are being attracted by the light shining on my face. We'll have one more look at this terrifying creature. I know that many of you will be arachnophobic, and the sight of a spider doing this will be terrifying. At least now it's walking down my back. Phew! I'm relatively safe for now. I don't think it's a dangerous spider. I hope it's not a dangerous spider. If I die during the course of the show, you'll know that I was wrong. Right, let's go back to the hyenas. Uh, Emma, a wonderful question from you. You're just nine years old, and you say, do hyenas hunt? You know what? 
Hyenas hunt more than they scavenge, especially over here. And especially during the migration season, you'll find them hunting quite a lot. And it's actually very unfair, the reputation hyenas have as nasty scavengers who don't do any hunting on their own. Now, you may just be able to hear some scrabbling and scraping on the car. That's because there's a hyena biting some piece of it. Anyway, I think that there is one of the smallest cubs that we have here. They don't have names yet. It's one of two. One of two little cubs that doesn't have a name yet. And we're actually not sure who their mother is. So that's very exciting. We've got Gefelte Fish, who is the third youngest, and then those two little ones there. So we're slowly unpacking what's going on here at the North Clan. Now, we have known Waffles cubs almost since the day they were born. Jamie discovered them with Waffles last year. Until recently, the North Clan's old matriarch had no direct heir, having lost all of her previous daughters. But with her latest litter of two, Waffles perhaps had a chance to extend her leadership lineage. Despite her age, she remained a dominant and fiercely protective mother. Hyena cubs assume their mother's status. If one of these cubs was female, Waffles may have been able to raise her to take the matriarchy. Alas, it was not to be. Waffles was challenged by her granddaughter Soup, and she lost. Waffles' new litter will have to fight for the matriarchy if they want it, just as their mother did so many years ago. So since that time, poor old Waffles was displaced as the matriarch, and of course, her two cubs, that was Grenadine and Ilovo, who you met there, they now fall in ranking. So they would have been the second and third most high ranking in the clan, but when Waffles lost the matriarchy, they immediately became the third, the... Oh, Jandre. Jandre's on camera, everybody. I've spotted something t terrifying. No, it's on the collar. It's right here. It's just here. Yes. Can you see it? Look. I'm being attacked again. Absolutely terrifying. I think it's a completely harmless spider. Anyway, so then... What would normally happen is that we'll just let that little spider stay there. What would normally happen is that our hyena clan matriarchy would pass on to the daughter of the matriarch. In this case, Waffles didn't actually have an older daughter. She only had her granddaughter, Soup. And so it's not that surprising that Soup took the matriarchy from her grandmother. And apparently over a period of, say, three or four months, they started noticing that Soup was becoming dominant over Waffles' cubs and then eventually over Waffles herself. Now, there seems to be quite a lot more activity here at the den. One or two more adults has arrived. Hopefully, Waffles will arrive too. So don't go anywhere. Come back to see the old matriarch. You watch the hyenas, everyone. I'm going to try and get rid of the spider. I'm not sure I want it down my shirt. I'm sure it's pretty harmless. It's gone now. Phew. So this is a little do dominance hierarchy battle playing out here. Um, I'm going to ask Kirsten something over the radio now. Kirsten, a friend of mine's daughter is watching, and she's just asked a question. Please will you look out for it? Thank you. Her name is Krithika. Her name is Krithika. Marvellous. Okay. Krithika is going to be deeply excited. So 
so great spending time with these hyenas, isn't it? Especially, you know, they're quite old now. Well, a lot of the cubs are old enough not to be underground when the parents aren't here. And the parents, I mean, they could certainly go underground if there was a threat, but they mess around and play while the folks aren't here, which is great because they're old enough to do that now. Another pile behind us. I'm just wondering if Waffleys hasn't arrived. I don't think she has. Sorry, John Dree. Oh, you're just under the wheel, are you? Uh-huh. 20 seconds, everyone, then we're back to TV. Everyone calm down, stay relaxed, don't panic. Welcome back to your live safari, everybody, sitting here in the Masai Mara of Kenya. It's very special to be here. If you want to talk to us, we are, of course, live, so you can ask us any questions you like. Send your questions to the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. You can also send us your comments. We'd love to hear from you. You are, of course, the most important part of any live safari. Other than these hyenas who are trying to muscle in on the action, one of them just tried to remove the fuel cap. That was the scrabbling that you could hear earlier. I had to bang the side of the car and make it go away. Let's go back to our hyenas here. Now, we have a lovely question coming in from Krithika, who is in Johannesburg. Krithika, you're quite interested in how long hyenas will be able to live for. Well, normally we think around 12 years. Remember, it's quite difficult to actually answer that question because very few hyenas are followed from birth until death. But around about 12 years, in captivity, they have lived for up to 25 years, but that would be almost unheard of out here. So let's say between 12 and 15 years, probably, depending on how tough life is. I suspect that hyenas in the Masai Mara live a little bit longer than their counterparts down south in the Kruger. I think there's more for them to eat here, and the landscape suits them a little bit better. Right, our hyenas are awake. They're just reasserting their dominance over each other, and we're going to pass you 1,600 miles, or 2,500 kilometers, back down to the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park, where Pat is with a lion. Well, I've actually spent a bit of time up in the Maasai Mara with the North Clan, and they are a very large and very charismatic clan. Oh, it's my wording there. But down here in South Africa, we have the Juma clan that hangs around, and they have actually left their den site, so we haven't seen them for quite some time, but still holding out hope that they do come down to check out this carcass but there's not much left. There is still a bit of meat left on this thing, but we can see by the size of this lion's belly that it has been chowing for quite some time now. It's uh, quite bulgy there, and this is something we often see in predators when they eat. Crokinso wants to know, is this lion going to hunt again? Well, that's a very good question. I did say that it has managed to steal a couple of kills, but with this limp, I'm really not confident that it will be able to successfully hunt again. But then having said that, it is a pretty tough male, this one, so we never know. But I think it will probably stick to stealing kills for now, at least until that leg is healed. And even if it wasn't as injured, male lions still tend to not do a whole heap of hunting in comparison to females. Don't get me wrong, they definitely will hunt, but they use their size and their strength to come in and take kills for their own, generally. And this is exactly what this one has been doing. Now this one is named Blondie this line, obviously because of that blonde streak. And now in domestic culture, cats versus dogs, generally dogs have the upper hand, but as we have seen, the Styx Pride got the upper hand in this one. Let's go look at the finishing of that horrible sighting. 
Guys, I know this is going to be very difficult for, uh, for, for a lot of you. So um, this is nature, so I cannot script what's going to happen next. The wild dog is dead. Um, she might feed on it. So uh, we're not going to chase after the pack. I mean, this, this, uh, this is really difficult for me. Wild dogs are my favorite, favorite animal. But um, this is behavior that you never really get to see. So let, we're going to stick with the lioness. She's probably going to come pick up that carcass again. She left it in the grass here. Now, it'll be interesting to see if the Birmingham boy comes back. Now she's, now this is predator on predator. So look at that, she, she's making, making sure it's dead. Um, I'm gonna try and find a little gap through the grass for you, Jandre. Now guys, if you are sensitive, now is not the time um, to be watching. There's, there's another lioness coming. Um, oh, she's biting the. Sorry, I'm 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 all over the place, guys. Just I'll, I'll take a second. So there's a second sticks lioness coming in. I'm not sure where the male is. Wow, guys. Oh, that that as as you know that happens in a flash. Oh, nothing can ever prepare you for for, for things like that. And I mean, I've seen. I've seen lions do this before, but I mean, we just, we haven't had dogs around for so long and, oh. Welcome back live. And that was obviously a very tough thing to see, but interesting as well. And of course, lions are the leading killers of wild dogs in the Kruger National Park. So, you know, not always nice to see things like that, but I suppose important for us to understand. Now we're sitting here with the hyenas and what's fascinating here is that there is the establishment and reinforcing of a hierarchy going on here. I think those two are fairly equally matched. They might even be siblings, the two biggest ones there. Could be Waffles' as cubs. They look t slightly too small, but it could be Ilovo and Grenadine. I'm not sure. And in fact, given their behavior, it's quite likely you can see that they are dominating the others. So look at this one here with its ears back on the right, the tail underneath, tucked underneath, and then being dominated by the bigger hyena with the tail flipped up in a very dominating posture. You can see it's quite clear which one is more dominant over the other. All right, let's go back in time now and back onto the river just north and west of where we're sitting now to Taylor and the migration. They're in the water. There they go. That's a much better spot to cross at earlier. They wanted to cross where there were some big crocodiles lying and waiting for them. Now that the first one has made it out on the other side, the rest are going to come streaming on in, and that's exactly what they're doing. Now, there are lots of other people here on safari from all over the world witnessing this amazing spectacle. So you're probably going to hear cameras going. You're probably going to hear cheers, and you might even hear some sad sounds that the crocodiles do grab one of these wildebeest. Look at them go. The current is pulling them downstream. There's some deep water. You can hear they're so stressed. They're all chanting, encouraging one another to keep swimming so that they can make it through. Up on the other side, another one. I haven't seen any crocodiles just yet. Oh, there might be one there. Those crocodiles will also get underneath the water and try and get in and amongst the herds and ambush them that way too. But there they go, all streaming on in. This is perfect. This is exactly what we've been waiting for. The first wildebeest crossing. Is there a crocodile? There's a crocodile. I think what Taylor says there about the stress those wildebeest must feel is extremely valid. Uh, you can see the stress because they just don't want to get into that water. And then when they do, the terror of what might jump out and grab them is just appalling. And also, of course, if the river's flowing very strongly, the chances of them being washed away and drowning is they're also high. So a very difficult time for the wildebeest. Our hyenas are still approaching us. I think it's got to do with our cameraman, Jandre's new deodorant, which I think he made from some cattle dung earlier today. And that's why the hyenas are coming up close to us. 
Ayanda, a very nice question from you about whether hyenas will eat each other or not. Yes, is the simple answer. They will eat each other. Not, they won't kill each other, though. They will scavenge off each other's carcasses. It's not very common, but it does happen, and we have seen it happen. It's very unlikely. In fact, it's almost unheard of for one of these hyenas to kill another and then eat its carcass, if you know what I mean. If there was a huge battle between two dominant females, it's possible that one would eat the other, and that does happen actually throughout the carnivores. We've seen leopards eating leopards, we've seen lions eating lions, and it's a very unpleasant thing to see, of course, and you can't imagine those amazingly cute little creatures possibly doing any damage to each other. Very special indeed to see them so cute and cuddling around. They won't be quite like that when they're adults, of course, unfortunately. They will be a lot more uh, sort of aggressive about keeping the hierarchy. These days, not so much. I think they're going to play a bit more, so we're going to stay right where we are. Please don't go anywhere. We'll see you very shortly. Sorry, no, we're just in internet break. Sorry, Seb's not having comms there, so I'm just letting you know that we are in internet break. Thankfully, we are in internet break, actually. Oh, I'm getting a bit of a roll here. What's... I'm trying to be Superman. Take off. Maybe a yoga pose, I don't know. Lions put themselves in the strangest positions. When they are relaxed, almost like a, a child sometimes. <laughs> oh, giving me daggers now because I said because I compared you to a child. I'm sorry, you're not a child. You're a big boy. Oh, and down it goes the leg. So no signs of anything else coming down to check out this carcass tonight. I do think. The presence of this lion may be keeping things away. <laughs> Doesn't look like it's going to be eating more tonight. Welcome back live everybody still here with this cat. He is up now and has kind of been moving around a little bit in the time that we have been gone. He has rolled a whole 180 degrees so good on him but we are still staying around in the hope that well there's three things that we actually hope might happen here. One is that something else is going to come out and check out this carcass, although as time goes on, I'm thinking that's going to be less and less likely, especially with this lion here. The second thing, which I'm really hoping is happening, is now that he's a bit dark, we may get a roar or two out of him. He was roaring very early this morning, probably at about 5, 5.30 in the morning, so we may get something like that happen again. Right. Well, I'm sure you are all very interested in the migration, especially after seeing uh, Taylor's clips. Let's go back up to the Mara where that happens and James can chat to you some more about it. Yes, I'm sure we all are very interested in the migration. The hyenas are very settled over here. Uh, Taylor, once again, let's go back down to the river and see what happened when the wildebeest finally did meet a crocodile. Mm. There's a crocodile. It's coming through. Again, that splashing of the water has definitely encouraged those reptiles to come through. But most of them seem to be quite fat. They've been eating well. There have been plenty of crossings of the zebra over the last couple of weeks. Listen to those poor wildebeest. Oh, it looks like the zebra have finally decided to plunge. There they go. There goes the first zebra. 
Come on, keep your ears out of the water. That couldn't be too nice. Here you go, but shallower, able to reach the bottom now. I do like the technique that the zebra use, sort of pushing themselves off of the rocks. This is absolutely amazing. Oh, it's a bit slippery there. They're struggling to get up the bank. And the more and more animals that cross in the same spot, the more difficult it's going to get. That crocodile is very uncertain as to what it's going to do. It's quite far away now from the other zebras. However, they are the strongest swimmers of the animals that we've seen so far. They reside in the Mara River all year long. The zebra are obviously feeling quite confident. They're stopping and pausing. Oh, those rocks are slippery. Look how they're struggling clambering up come on zebra here we go you can do it the crocodile as well is just lurking it's just watching but its time is up it's about to miss its opportunity for an afternoon meal and that's exactly what has happened because those zebra have basically made it out alive. No casualties here this afternoon at Main North and another successful crossing. That was absolutely unbelievable. And I hope you all enjoyed that just as much as I do. And I'm looking forward to watching the migration over the next couple of weeks. So what's so exciting for me about what you've just seen and these little hyenas is of course that they have never seen a migration. None of them have, were alive during the big, or during the mo or sort of height of the migration last year. And so they are sitting here not knowing what kind of amazing wildlife carnival is about to take place in their lives. And I think that's really exciting indeed. Let's have one last look at them there. Well, we'll look at them for the last few minutes. They're just looking so very cute and Sunday evening-ish, aren't they? There they are. Now we've got a question from Lee about the power in a jaw of a hyena. Well, the best way to say this is that a hyena's jaws, when it's an adult, have a bite force of about 1,100 pounds per square inch. Now that's very difficult to kind of understand, but a human being has a bite force of about a tenth of that. We can bite down at around about 100 pounds per square inch. So about 10 times as powerful as you can bite. And you know how powerful your jaws are, Lee. So hyenas are that much more powerful. And of course, they're used to crush bones. They're used to, well, kill, obviously. And they've got very specialized teeth that allow them to crush bones and get a lot of food from prey that many other animals wouldn't be able to. They're the only animals that can crush big bones and get nutrition from them. And that's one of their very special adaptations. It's very difficult to imagine these little things running after the migration, causing havoc and hunting, but that is what they are going to do one day if they stay safe. And given how huge the North Clan is, it's very likely that they will stay safe because the North Clan is very protective of them. And you can see they're having just a wonderful sleep. That's going to be it from this episode, everyone. We will see you at the same time, same place next week. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a wonderful week wherever you happen to be in South Africa. We can't wait to see you for the finale next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>